everyone and welcome to the third meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee in 2013. Can I remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones and other electronic devices uh, so that we don't get disturbed. Um, before we hear from our UC witnesses this morning, we have one item to consider and that's whether to uh, take item three on our agenda in private. Um, it's a discussion on our approach to the scrutiny of the regulations on the passport benefits arising from the Welfare Reform Further Provision Scotland Act 2012. So, do members agree that we take that in private? Agreed. Okay, thank you very much. And that brings us to agenda item two, which is our evidence taking session with members of the public who have got in touch with the committee through the URC initiative, which we set up to help hear the concerns of people affected by the welfare reforms and changes to benefits. All three testimonies, which we'll hear in a moment, give a good snapshot of some of the issues from the many other submissions we received through this initiative. Uh, I think we'll just go through each of the, the witnesses in, in turn, and I think we'll all agree just to do it from nearer to me to further away if that's acceptable. So we'll hear this morning from Marlene Hepburn, then Leslie McMurtry, and Ian McGahey. Okay, so I'll pass you over to uh, Marlene, and you can give us your statement. Thanks very much. Right. My name is Marlene Hepburn. I have multiple sclerosis and have recently been reassessed for the new benefit replacing incapacity benefit. I was retired from my job as senior teacher on grounds of ill health five years ago. My experience of the new work capability assessment was dreadful. The first ap appointment was cancelled at the moment I turned up for the appointment. A second appointment was arranged, adding to my already heightened stress level. I found the actual assessment was stressful and was devastated to be told that as a result of the assessment, I no longer qualified for the new benefit. I would be moved on to job seekers allowance. And I have a copy of my assessor's report, which in my mind places huge emphasis on how well I looked and how well turned out I was. I look well because I self-manage my condition well. With the help of medication, injections three times a week of interferon, and I also try to, find, to lead a healthy lifestyle, being proactive in my approach to the disease. My fear at this precise moment in time is that this whole experience will trigger a relapse. The emotional stress has been enormous and has had a detrimental impact of, on my health. I am in the process of requesting a, reconsid a reconsideration stroke appeal, further adding to my worries. Financial worries were added today with a letter from the DWP confirming cessation of my incapacity benefit. I appreciate the benefit system needs to be reformed, but not to the detriment of genuine claimants. Following my communication with regard to my experience with ATOS, I thought I would update you on the latest turn of events. On Saturday, I received a response to a submission on my behalf for a reconsideration of the decision a 71-page response, which said there was no new evidence to overturn the decision and I could now go to appeal. This was Saturday, and since then, my level of anxiety reached an almost unbearable level. I had just had my regular checkup with my MS specialist nurse on the Friday, and she had advised me to keep my stress levels down as it is a well-established fact, stress has a damaging impact on MS. I am trying to control my stress, but I have now reached my limit and do feel extremely vulnerable and anxious as to what my MS will do now. Welfare reform is a good idea in practice, but when it has such a negative impact on the vulnerable, then somebody needs to listen and action needs to be taken to protect people like me. I worked as a teacher for many years and was retired through ill health. MS is incurable. There is no magic miracle cure. My latest sick line from my GP sent to the DWP just days before my latest bombshell was for a year. His opinion apparently counts for nothing. Thanks very much. Uh, Leslie. Good morning, members. <coughs> My name's Leslie McMurchie and I'm the principal carer for my husband, Charles. My husband was retired from work five years ago, having been employed as a social worker since 1973.
He was never off sick until he was re retired due to permanent incapacity following a mental breakdown due, due to workload and family problems. He also has some physical problems. He has asthma, arthritis in his knee, spine and neck, as well as high blood pressure and swelling in his ankles. He has limited rotation in his wrist and swelling in his fingers, as well as pain in his wrist following a fall in the garden, where he lost concentration and fell over a garden pot. Mentally, he is very fragile. He's virtually reclusive, only going out accompanied by me. He's socially withdrawn too. When family visits, he removes himself from the scene and goes upstairs to his study. He finds, him, he finds organizing himself very difficult and I prompt him regularly when I'm at home. He loses items regularly and I often find that what he's looking for, he can't see them. Things like his glasses and letters. He regularly drops his medication and I often find pills on the floor. Just last night, I found two pills on the floor. And when I asked him if he has taken the correct dose, he's unable to tell me. When I'm not around, as I work five days, he sits in his dressing gown, unwashed and undertakes no tasks around the house. He was able to claim incapacity benefit and he has had his health reviewed by the DWP annually since first complaining incapacity benefit. Each time he scored sufficient points. That was until he was, an uh, he was assessed in June 2012 for ESA. He had undergone three assessments prior to the June assessment. The first two were carried out by DWP doctors. These two assessments were conducted in an atmosphere where my husband was able to discuss his illnesses and how they affect him without sticking rigidly to a set question and answer framework. The doctor clarified my husband's answers before recording them and was sensitive to my husband, which I felt helped a great deal as he gets confused and loses concentration during longer discussions. He clearly was experienced in handling patients with mental health problems. These two assessments fully recorded my husband's medical conditions and when we sent for a copy, we agreed fully with the assessment. The assessment before June 2012 was carried out by filling in a form and he had received notification that he had scored sufficient points and didn't need to attend the medical. His health over the last year has deteriorated and he is presently waiting to see a psychiatrist. And I'll just add in now, he has now seen a psychiatrist and he's on two afternoons of inpatient treatment at our local hospital. But he, has be he was told at that time the waiting list would mean that he had to wait 12 weeks minimum. And from this fact alone, his mental health has deteriorated since his last fit for work assessment. He also has a broken wrist, he broke his wrist last summer and has a metal plate fitted and now he has limited mobility using his hand due to swelling and pain. He cannot tie his shoelaces and button shirts due to his wrist and swelling in his fingers. On the day of the assessment, he had to take additional medication, eight milligrams of diazepam, before he was able to leave the house. He took some before entering the medical, four milligrams, as we had to wait for over an hour as there had been a mix-up in the booking, which was commented on posit as a positive in the final report. And he, had an additional, and he had additional medication on arriving home of four milligrams. There was no opportunity reveal to reveal this at the medical as the structure did not allow for any deviation from the set questions. Indeed, when he said that he was having a bad day, this was recorded, but not explored or discussed. The assessment itself was conducted in a manner geared to clients I felt with physical disabilities, with only about five minutes of the 60 minutes being devoted to his mental health. 
None of his answers were recorded accurately. The report was a cut and paste job of small parts of answers which were geared to showing him <coughs> as having no difficulties, i.e. when he was asked if he walked to the local shop, he answered that he'd only attempted this twice in the past three months and he had found the ordeal harrowing. This was recorded as he was able to walk to the local shop. There was no follow-up questioning of why he found this harrowing, which could have illuminated his mental health difficulties. I also felt that by this time we had been there for nearly an hour, but in fact nearly two and a half, including the long wait before going in. And my husband was struggling mentally to cope, but was putting a brave face on it and was desperate to get out of the room. I also felt the nurse needed us away as she had other appointments. She also made a comment about my husband's skin tone, saying he had a good tan, which I took to mean that she thought he spent his time out of doors enjoying the sunshine. Well, last June was a particularly wet month and my husband's highly florid skin tone is a result of steroid medication he takes for his asthma. I was hurt by this thoughtless comment but did not respond as my husband was clearly feeling the pressure of the assessment and would not have coped if I had questioned the nurse about it. Needless to say, when we received the result, he was fit for work. It was as expected as it was obvious from the medical examination and the subtle negative feelings projected by the nurse. We went to the citizens' advice for advice re and appeal and were advised to see our GP and get a sick note and appeal the decision. We subsequently visited our GP who refused to give my husband a sick note as he said if he had been assessed as fit work for work by ATOS then he must be. After a lengthy discussion he gave my husband a sick note with fit for part-time work on it. We took this to the DWP and were told there were no facilities for this. You were either fit for work or not. He was told he had all his contributions paid, so there was no point in him claiming ESA, as he had a pension. Furthermore, they would not help him find part-time work, as they were too busy finding work for others who needed full-time employment who were claim claiming ESA. This is supposed to be an improvement on the benefits system. Well, words fail me. Thanks very much, Leslie. Uh, Ian. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Ian McGahey. I'm a veterinary surgeon who has been unable to work for the last nine years and received incapacity benefit at the higher rate for eight years. My difficulty started when I was sent for an ATOS assessment. I suffer from fibromyalgia and severe allergic illnesses. I travelled into central Glasgow by bus and train and then had an hour's wait for my appointment. By the time I was seen, I was suffering severe pain and discomfort. My memory is not totally reliable due to my state, but I think the interviewer offered on three or four occasions to stop the process due to my obvious distress. I stated I'd be just the same at any subsequent interview, so I would rather proceed and reduce the overall amount of pain that I would suffer. Towards the end of the session, she stated that she would not conduct the physical examination as this would cause me even more distress. She then inquired how I was to return home. When I stated that I'd have to use the train and bus, she very kindly organised for a taxi to take me to my door due to this obvious serious suffering I was experiencing. Given all these facts, I was totally incredulous to be told by a telephone conversation from a DWP employee that ATOS had assigned a score of zero. This caused me enormous distress as it effectively labelled me as untruthful and it completely impugned my honour. When I informed the person from the DWP of the circumstances of the interview outlined above, he just repeated over again, so you say, as if I had invented the whole matter. I asked him to seek proof from Atos as to the veracity of my statement, given his scepticism. My incredulity was further increased when I was informed verbally 
that my written submission had been assessed and that the DWP had allocated a score of 66. During the conversation, I was eventually informed that they would reassess my application if I could organise written statements from medical practitioners. Reports were arranged from my occupational therapist, consultant physician and my GP. All this information was just enough for the DWP employee to award the minimum 15 points for me to qualify for the work-related ESA. However, this only lasts for one year and then stops. I find living a major difficulty and work would be an impossibility. Given this, I had to appeal the decision and will have to attend a tribunal in order to re receive the support group status. The tendent stress that this process has caused over the last 11 months has caused a real worsening of my condition. I have suffered multiple infections due to stress-reduced immunity and I have been placed in antidepressants. While waiting for the appeal, I was phoned by an employee of the DWP to be told that he would not have even placed me in the work-related group, essentially implying that my appeal was useless. The following day, after a prolonged wait, I collapsed in the doctor's waiting room and required a 999 ambulance call-out. The diagnosis was a severe flare-up of my condition caused by stress. I believe that the call from the DWP was a major contributing factor. My, my condition continued to deteriorate in that I have begun to use a wheelchair intermittently. After waiting seven months for the appeal, and only two weeks after the last call from the DWP, I received another call from the same operator to say that he had received a letter from my consultant psychiatrist and had phoned her personally. As a result of this phone call, he was placing me in the support group ESA and that I wouldn't be bothered until December 2014. <coughs> but even then, I would only have to be required to resubmit the, psychi the psychiatrist report and the support group status would be renewed. The following week, I received a letter indicating that I'd attend another ATOS assessment. As you may imagine, I was stunned and extremely upset. I contacted the DWP to be told that this was an error and they confirmed that I was indeed on the support group. I have subsequently received another letter indicating that I was in the work-related group and again I had to check that this was another mistake. When asked how I spend my time, I reply that actively trying to maintain my sanity accounts for the majority of my limited reserves of energy. I've tried to present the facts that are hopefully relevant to your inquiry without being too descriptive of the physical and emotional state that I suffer. Even composing this short letter caused stress, which has the consequence of worsening my condition. I will do my best to help with any additional information that you require. Thank you. Well, thanks very much to you all for your contributions. It may, must have been difficult for you have to recount that, but it's absolutely invaluable to, to us in terms of us uh, getting an understanding of, of just exactly what you've all had to endure uh, and hopefully to inform us uh, each time we've taken evidence or heard from individuals. Uh, certainly for me, it's raised more and more questions about this whole process. Um, I'll open it up to members shortly, but just a couple of things that I wanted to ask um, for clarification because the, you know, the, the picture that I had been given when we met with Atos uh, following our last year, say, uh, evidence session, um, is not sort of matching up with the information that you've given us this morning. Now, there may be good reasons for that. We'll have to go back to Atos and find out why that's the case. You've all mentioned, or I think yeah, certainly you, you've made a, a point of it and other people have mentioned, about the allocation of points. Now, the, Atos went to great lengths to take us through how they compile the information. But I don't remember, and I don't know whether Alex or, or Kevin were there, they never mentioned them allocating points. Did they tell you that that's what they were going to do, and do you see that when you get the report back um, yeah. in terms of the points? There's that actually happened? descriptors on the web that you can download, and these are the descriptors they use to award the points. Mm -hmm. Who's awarding the points, though? The, the, 
Atos. What, what worries me here is that we've been told that Atos do a, an objective assessment and they pass that on and somebody at the DWP makes the decision. Is it possible that somebody at the DWP is awarding points based on the Atos assessment? Are you suggesting that Atos do that themselves? My understanding is the report I got was from the doctor <coughs> that, that did the, the assessment and it said, therefore, I awarded... I got six points. That was how how disabled I am, I got six. And she said, as Miss Hepburn could, I awarded no points. So in my mind, it's perfectly clear this is Atos that's awarding the points. So I got six. And when I got somebody to come and, and talk me through by the report, he got me up to, I think we were up to 16. So. Uh, so before I bring Kevin I have in. the medical report my husband here and there are no points on the medical report but the letter that came from Department of Work and Pensions has my husband was awarded six points at the medical or from the medical evidence and the forum that he submitted the I take it it's a <coughs> some kind of adjudicator that looks at they call them decision makers decision makers yes. someone yeah. looks at what we have submitted and the medical report. There's no points on the report. I've got the full report. But there is an appoint allocation by this... What did you call it? Decision, Decision maker. maker. Decision maker. Yeah, I think we need to get clarity around yes. just who is appointing or allocating these points because Atos went to great lengths to, to convince us, if you like, that they had no input into the actual outcome of the, the decision. They just collect the information and pass it to the DWP. Now, if, if you're, yeah, if you're telling us that there are points allocated on the information that they collate, then that's yeah. not quite the picture that they created, Karen. Convener, again, I mean, it comes as no su surprise at this committee to get new information all of the time. Um, but, you know, I think that in terms of our visit to Atos, uh, there was absolutely no mention of that point system. Um, and there were DWP officials there who could have told us that the decision maker uh, is, uh, did it in that regard. But I would find it very difficult to see how they could come up with a points-based score based on the assessment criteria that we actually seen in that visit. I think it would be extremely difficult. And if such a point system does exist, then I think that we need to get somebody from the DWP in here to explain how that actually works. Because um, in my mind, convener, and I don't know about yourself or, or Alec, I think it would be extremely difficult uh, to base a point system round about the basic questions uh, that there were, uh, in, or the basic information that there was from the questions on the um, computer screens that we actually saw. Um, so I think that without a doubt, after hearing this evidence, we need the DWP to come in and explain, first of all, what this point system is uh, and how points are allocated. I think it would be extremely difficult for a decision maker to base points on what we've seen uh, because at the end of the day, they were not present at that particular interview. There's a major flaw in the system when it comes to this, but... Um, before I come on to, to members and actually open up to all of them, there was just one other thing that I wanted to clarify because, again, this comes back to the information we uh, obtained when we were speaking to Atos and subsequently have corresponded with Atos. Can you confirm, each of you individually, whether your GP supplied a report along with the initial assessment? No. You're all shaking your heads, so none of your no. GPs... None of the GPs, I'm not my neurologist or my MS nurse. None. Nobody. So Neither it was purely time. based on information that either you supplied yourself yes. and the ATOS assessment. The GPs made no contribution at the outset. No. Okay. Can I ask, in that respect, do you, are you aware of whether ATOS had sought information from your as medical far team? As I know, my neurologist has had no contact from ATOS and my MS nurse had no contact from ATOS. I asked the GP and he had had no contact. I don't think ATOS had anything to do with the medical representatives. And yet Atos made it clear to us that they contact the, the, uh, the claimant's GP as part of the initial... They, they, they told us that they would make a decision on whether to call someone in based on the response they get from their GP at the, the outset. I understood. I was called in because I'd filled the form in without any 
advice from anybody. I filled it in truthfully myself, and that was why I was called for a medical, a face-to-face, -face, because I had been completely honest about my condition, and I listed the people they could go and ask, and they didn't ask anybody. They just pulled me in and then put me out. Right, I'll open it up to the, the committee. I'll take uh, Vice Convener first and then come to you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener, and uh, thank you to you all for uh, the uh, evidence you've given thus far. As Kimmy says, it's very uh, helpful in terms of the work we are undertaking. I've got a, a question for uh, Marlene Hepburn, and for the public record, I should declare she has no relation. <laughs> My discussion earlier, we have a distant relation somewhere. Um, just in terms of uh, the evidence uh, you provided, uh, Marlene, you, you said you found the actual assessment uh, very stressful. Um, and then you went on to talk about the, the impact that that had on you. But could you quantify uh, for us why, why was it a stressful process? Well, the girl came out, introduced herself <coughs> as Ileana, Dr Ileana, whoever she was. She took me in to a room, and I had my sister with me who'd come down from Fraserburgh. And she turned and she said, I see you've brought somebody with you. And she turned to my sister, looked her up and down and went, exactly who are you? Well, a word of warning, you don't do that to my sister. She's an ex-deputy head, not a good boy. So she said, I'm, your si I'm her sister. So that was okay, we sat down. She then went through the descriptors that, as I say, I didn't even know existed. And then she said, I need to do a physical examination. I'll need to get you on the, get up on the table. Well, I looked at the table and there were three steps up. No handrail. And I thought, right, I've got to get up on there. She's expecting me to get up on there. So I went up the steps. I went up one step, two steps, turned, sat down, and then swung my legs around, because I knew if I'd climbed the third step, I was away. So that was fine. She got me lying on the table, and then she said to me, I, I want you to raise your leg. Can you raise your right leg? Which I did, and she went, is that the best you can do? And I said, yes, so I put it down again. And she did the same with the other. She said, now, can you tell me? Why couldn't you lift your leg any higher? I said, well, it was heavy and it was wobbly. Yes, but you couldn't lift. I said, no, I've got MS. Right. And that was it. <laughs> and my sister said as well, she's got MS. To come off the table, I had to come down the steps on my bottom because I thought if I stand up on the top step to come down, I'm away. And she's expecting me to come down, therefore I'll come down. In the report, she said Miss Hepburn accessed and left the table unaided. True, but not accurate. And it's, it was things like that where she took no account. Sorry to do this, but I didn't want to do this in public. I have a problem with my bowels. If any of the witnesses are uncomfortable about any personal information, don't, you no, don't feel obliged to, to I'll say I'll go anything. this bit because it is important. I have a problem with my bowels. Now, she asked questions, and being the typical Scot, I tried to make it less serious than it was. So I said that I wore pads, and the report said she only wears pads. Yeah, but I changed them, like maybe three, four times a day. Now, that wasn't in the report because it never got that deep. And it was the dismissal of the fact that I had these problems, but they really weren't important. They didn't impact on my life. And as I say, the whole thing, I felt really threatened because it was conducted in very much of need to get you out. Three quarters of an hour I sat, and that was noted in the, the report. Miss Hepburn sat for 45 minutes with no apparent sign of discomfort. Now, I was brought up. It was an interview. You go in, you sit down, you sit there till you're finished, and then you leave. So I ne and I never thought to say to her, excuse me, I'm feeling uncomfortable. I just sat there, did the interview. I wanted to get out, but that went against me because I sat for 45 minutes. The report also stressed that I swim. Yes, I swim. I don't go up and down the pool. I go to the university when it's half length and it's so many metres deep. I only do so many lengths and I come out. I don't up and down, up and down. I do my lengths. It might take me 30 minutes. It might take me 45 minutes. It might take me longer. Her report was Miss Hepburn swims for 45 minutes a week. So essentially what, I mean, it sounds as though part of it was an attitudinal 
problem from the individual, but also, and that sounds quite similar to uh, what we, we saw in Ms McMurkey's uh, 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 submission in terms of uh, the part about her husband going to the, the shops. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very, you can say something and they'll, 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 they'll we'll apply it very literally rather than deal with the, the nuance. So that, that's the problem. The, and the fact that I, I keep myself healthy, I follow my health professional's advice. I try to keep myself mobile because if I don't, I don't know what will happen. But also, I am the secretary of the local MS branch and I type up the minutes. That went against me. Miss Hepburn is the secretary of the local MS branch and she types up the minutes. She attends meetings. Fair enough. We get a cup of tea and a biscuit. I'll, do, I'll go for a cup of tea and a biscuit. I type the minutes up. I've got computer skills. Yes, but she doesn't see me sitting in front of the computer going, I've lost that cursor again. You can put whatever adjective you want in front of me. And I sit there for ages going, show yourself to me. And I get the minutes, but the minutes are all there. Up the top is, I just have to change the date. I just have to change who's there. It's the same process, matters arising, blah, 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 blah. And it's just the same process. So I do very little new input. It's just the information. And luckily, my chairperson gives me a printed, printed sheet of what's going to happen at the meeting. So I'm simply transferring from there to there. But I have computer skills, therefore I'm employable. And I also see, and you mentioned, and this isn't the first time we've heard this, that um, emphasis was placed in the report on how you were turned out. Uh, I mean, it sounds to me from what you said, almost would have been better if you'd turned up slovenly uh -huh. and you don't. You were totally inactive. Do you think that would have counted more for you? Miss Hepburn is well turned out, dressed neatly, tidily, dressed tidily. And I was with my big sister, she's older than me now, she wouldn't have let me go out of the house untidy. And I thought, to say that I look well, yes, I look well because I have lost weight, I exercise, I try to eat healthily, I watch what I do, I don't go overtired, I look this good because I work at it. But when I go home from the, the Atos thing, that was me done for the day. You know, I said to my sister, you can forget doing anything. But no, I look well, and I present myself well, and I have good eye contact. But I was a teacher, so sorry. <laughs> Old habits die hard. So I remember most teachers had good uh, eye contact from the back of their head as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my kids used to say, you got eyes in the back? I said, yes, that's why I've got longer hair, because you can't see them. But no, that, that, there was huge emphasis on that, I look well. OK. Well, th thank you, Ms. Hepburn. I have to say I'm slightly terrified of your sister now. <laughs> that evidence. Can I turn to uh, Ms. McMurkey? I'm kind of confused by, and clearly you were as well, where you, you say here that the delay in your appointment was somehow referred to as positive in the report. What, what, what do you mean? Um, what the, um, it actually stated was very similar to what um, you had that because he didn't walk out and sat waiting for the appointment to go in and have the medical, that was a positive thing. Because if he was, I assume the inference of that is, if he was as poorly and unable to cope, he would have walked out. He would not have sat. But it didn't take account of the amount of medication that he had been taking and took while he was there. Um, it was commented on as a positive. It seems extraordinary that could be held uh, against uh, yes. uh, uh, someone. You, you say in your uh, submission as well that uh, the final report was a cut and paste job and you gave the example I referred to earlier mm. about um, them saying that your husband's answer led them to conclude that he was able to walk to the, the local shop, whereas you know, he, he found it very difficult to, to do so. Do you have other examples? Absolutely. That, that lead you to many, a many, job? many examples. I've brought the, the form along with me. Um, okay, let's have a look here. <coughs> Probably does it. positive <clears throat> he gets out of bed and it says despite pain but he went into quite a bit about his he gets out of bed 
very late, and one of the reasons is because of his mental health problem. And um, he finds getting up to face the day very, very difficult. And um, I'm, I prompt him um, my breaks at 11 o'clock in the morning at work, and I phone home and ask him, are you up? Usually he is up by that time. Sometimes he's not up. And if he's not up, I phone at one o'clock at my, my lunchtime. And I phone then and say, um, are you up? And he usually is up by that time. Um, but sometimes he's not. Um, and when I get home from work, I haven't yet found him in bed. But I find him every single day sitting with his dressing gown on at that time, at half four, five o'clock at night, sitting unwashed, and that's a big problem for me, um, and it's a big problem for him. Uh, so, despite having pain, because he has arthritis in his spine, his neck, and his arms, and he's waiting for a knee operation to have a replacement knee, um, that was seen as a positive, but he actually gets out of bed. Didn't say the time that he gets out of bed, his feeling about having to get up in the morning, all that was talked about, but it was, you know, it was described as a positive part. Um, he has a walk-in shower, was described as a positive thing. Um, he actually, we don't have a walk-in shower, so that is an actual inaccurate bit, part. We have a shower over a bath. And he, we explained the difficulty he had with walk, washing, that if he sits in the bath, he regularly can't get up. And that was particularly um, with his, his hand to lever himself up with arthritis in his neck and spine. Um, we explained that in quite some detail um, and that he uses a shower, but he, it's quite difficult because he has to lift his leg over the bath. We don't have a walk-in shower, but it does say he has a walk-in shower. I could go through this whole thing because everything... He drives for five minutes to the supermarket and the GP surgery most weeks. He doesn't see the GP most weeks. He sees the GP... Well, in fact, he's been seeing the GP regularly now because since um, ATOS, the assessment, his mental health has deteriorated and he's now on an inpatient programme. Um, he never drives to the super... He never goes to the supermarket. I go to the supermarket. And that was explained to them. The, the thing was totally inaccurate. He watches television most days. He does watch the television most days. And he generally prefers to watch the news. And he watches television for half an hour at a time. And that's accurate. But that was described as a positive. Did they explain why what the relevance might be of him watching television, especially watching I the news, might be to his I, fitness for work? They didn't explain that, but I think that was to show that he had some concentration, that he could watch the television. But quite regularly, when we're watching the news because we both really enjoy it, and we actually enjoy watching um, Parliament um, on, and, and watching all the committees and things like that. <laughs> and he'll, he'll watch the television, and he, um, he's away in another little... He, he goes off into his own little um, place, and I'll say to him, did you hear that? And he'll go, what? Did you hear what he said there? You know, and none of this was explored, but it was taken as positives. Um, and a, another positive, he has to stand to ease the pain to allow him to sit for longer peri periods. And I'm assuming that is so that adjustments could be made to work, that you can stand up and, and move. Um, he moves his joints, he bends his knees and he stretches and he moves around his back, which he does constantly throughout the day. And that was taken as a positive. Just one final question, if I may convene, and then I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. Uh, just a question for, for Ian. In terms of... Uh, I was intrigued by the uh, your experience where it seems as there was a lot of toing and froing uh, with the, the DWP, and eventually they uh, accept you should be in the, the support group ESA, but you then got these uh, 
other letters and then another letter, or you got a letter saying that you had to be reassessed and then another letter saying you were on the work. Did they explain how this mistake came around? The first one they said it was um, just unfortunate timing. It wasn't unfortunate timing for them, it was flaming unfortunate timing for me. Um, you know, it was an emotional roller coaster with events. It, it's just inefficiency um, and no caring. I mean, I could see why, I mean, it's clearly unfortunate timing for you in terms of the, the duress, but I could maybe see how, you know, a letter maybe automatically comes out the first time, but then the second time when you've already been told, actually, you're on a, the, a certain type of ESA and then, you you know, the letter comes out the other. What was the explanation for that? I'll um, phrase Oscar Wilde, to lose one parent is unfortunate, to lose two is carelessness. I don't think we've ever had Oscar Wilde in this country <laughs> before. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, um, convener. Um, can I can I start by asking uh, Ms. Hepburn? Um, you mentioned the seventy-one page response uh, that you received back. I wonder if you could go into a little bit more detail about that response. Obviously, not go through the entire seventy-one pages, um, but you know, what kind of things did that response actually have in it? Well. When I got the response, the big envelope <clears throat> dropped in, right? So I opened it up, 71 pages. I put it to the side, and I thought, I can't go through that. Three o'clock in the morning, couldn't sleep. What do you do? You read the report. <sighs> One of the things they said which completely and utterly devastated me was that any reasonable pair... I have dropped foot, which I now wear a, an ankle brace for, which, as I explained, it doesn't eradicate the problem. The foot will still drop but it, it helps to relieve the number of times I do that. And it, I, do, I can't wear it in the house because I can't wear it with slippers. I've got to wear it with shoes with laces. So when I fall in the house, there was one day I fell and took the toenail off. Well, that meant a trip to hospital, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, it said that any reasonable, any reasonable person implying, not me, would use a manual wheelchair on a, day to, on a daily basis to manoeuvre around the house or manoeuvre around wherever I was. I've had MS for 30 years, over 30 years. I've never, the only time I go in a wheelchair is when I go to, on holiday. Hmm, big, big problem, because that's one they're gonna get me on. How do I manage to go on holiday? I get the wheelchair at the airport. My sister, well, they push me, or if there's nobody there, my sister pushes me. It meets me when I come off the plane, they feel me through. But they recommended that any reasonable person would use a wheelchair on a daily basis. That devastated me. I am in a, the local MS society. I'm quite proud of the fact I walk into the meetings, I walk out. I hope that gives encouragement to newly diagnosed people who get the, di the diagnosis. They come to the meeting, three quarters of the people are in wheelchairs. And here, this one walks in looking good with no wheelchair. I think that's a positive for other MS. I'll not say sufferers because my chairperson will annihilate me. People who've got MS, that, they, they recommended that. That devastated me, completely and utterly devastated me. I thought, what's the point? I'm not in a wheelchair, but hey ho, who needs to worry about being in a wheelchair? I keep my mobility. That's why I swim, I walk. I exercise, I eat healthily. I want to keep out of a wheelchair. I mean, that was another thing that the, the, the woman said. Have you got stairs in your house? And in the form I had put, it was a bungalow, right? And she said, have you got stairs in your house? And my sister from behind me said, the clues in the word bungalow. And at that point I thought, oh, Kathleen, you've just blown it. But, you know, I don't have stairs in my house. I have one, stair to, one step to get in, one step to get out the back to my patio. It's on the level. I have no stairs. I can still fall in my house. And usually I'm in my bare feet, which is why I took the toenail off. But I have to... I now wear an ankle brace. I have to. Because it, it stops the, the frequency of falling. But it still happens. And when I fall, it's a triple whammy. I take the knee out of my trousers... I wet myself and I soil myself. So then I have to be assisted to a toilet, which is why I always travel on holiday with my sister in case this happens. And she can tell people that, that she feels quite heartless because I, I trip, 
I lie on the pavement and she stands and watches me and all these people rush up, as you do, and they're pulling at me and she'll say, no, no, she's fine, just leave her. And they can see her looking at her thinking, oh, you heartless bosom. But I know that my legs will not support me, so I lie there till I get the power back in my legs. I then have to have something to lean on to get up. And once I'm up, I'm fine. But that, that's what's in the report, you know. So you, you said that you've had MS for 30 years. Um, and from the evidence that you gave, you said that you retired uh, on the grounds of ill health some five years ago. So obviously for, for 25 years of having uh, or being diagnosed with MS, you actually carried on working during that period of time. As a teacher, it was, it got progressively more difficult because the tiredness, I, I didn't usually suffer from tiredness, but the tiredness became, began to be a problem. And when I said to my head teacher, I'm really tired today, she went, we're all tired, it's Christmas time, Marlene. And at that point, I went to my doctor and said, look, you know, I need to do something about this. And he, he actually wrote a very, very strongly worded sick note which completely blew the whole thing open with the council. It was, it was horrendous. And again, that was stressful. So then I was off on sickness for a, a year. I couldn't go back to work and I got granted ill health, retirement and ill health. Now, as I say, MS is incurable. Okay, I am very, very lucky. My MS is controlled by injections, but even the injections can cause problems because one Christmas I injected myself. It was Christmas, I was up at my sister's I got up at three, three o'clock in the morning and said to Catherine, I have terrific pain in the site I've injected. We had to get to the local hospital and they, dis they discovered I had a cyst. Where I'd put the needle in, I had a bruise and it got infected, so I had to get a, a, an infection. And it was incredibly painful. So even the injections, I have to watch. I can no longer inject in my left lower and I have to inject in my arms. I have bruises all over my abdomen. See when, see, when I go swimming, I hate showers where you all shower together because I go in there and they'll look, this woman's got puncture marks all over her abdomen. And, you know, they must think, you know, what on earth? And I have problems with that. I have bruising on my legs, on my arms. Well, they're unsightly, but I do that. And because I inject three times a week with interferon, I, I'm, in, I'm in control of my MS, which is a really... Silly position to be in, because you think, I'm in control of this, and I'm just terrified that I lose control, because the MS can flare up at any time. Yes, it's remittent relapsing, which is, you know, I can have a flare up, I can be fine. I can be fine for ages, and then suddenly the symptom comes back. And that's my fear. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mrs McMurchie, we've heard from uh, Ms Hepburn that... Um, she worked for 25 years uh, with MS. Uh, in your written evidence, you, you said that your husband started work as a, a social worker um, in 1973. Um, can you maybe tell us when his illness started and when he actually gave up work? Yes, uh -huh. um, his illness actually started around about um, the year 2000. Um, at that point, um, we had the going into the, the work part of it, um, the council reorganised his job and, and there had been three senior social workers and the job was amalgamated and he was put in charge of um, the whole of Fife Council um, for community service for offenders. I don't really like to go into too much of that, cause, but that, the, the, the constant pressure of running a service on his own, um, he found very, very difficult. Um, I don't mind talking about the family problems we had. At that point in time, um, my father had lung cancer um, and my daughter um, was 16 and she, had, she was diagnosed with ME and she was bedridden for over six months. Um, and the combination of the pressure in that year, he was off work. That was his first very critical um, depressive um, episode and he was off work for six months. Um, but he got back to work and he worked quite well um, for another few years 
And then he had another um, critical episode where work-related problems built up and he couldn't cope. And he was off work for another six months. And finally, he was off just before he was medically retired for about a year and a half. Um, first year, he was on half pay and then he was in... Um, and then he was medically retired. So he had had, before that, he had been off with um, depression and associated. The arthritis had always been there and the asthma had always been there, but we had always managed it yeah. until we couldn't manage it any further. And the council decided that he should be um, retired on permanent incapacity. Um, and it was with mental health problems. Okay, thank you. And Mr. McGarry, you said that you were a, a vet. Um, can I ask how long he actually undertook the job of, of vet yep. surgery? Well, I, I qualified in '84, um, so when I, you know, when I had to stop work, I was a senior partner in my own practice. Um, I was a, a university lecturer um, as well, um, part-time university lecturer. Um, and one of the, the when, when I stopped work um, with, with this one was when one of the clients took my business partner aside and you know virtually accused him of being you know callous so and so and allowing me to be at my work. I think one of the things that's apparent, you know, I think a lot of the general public have this idea of you know the chronic ill is you know these feckless people that give up and sit about you know and, and don't try. I, you know, I make massive efforts. I've made massive efforts to try and get better from this. Uh, I've got, you know, I wrote out a list of 38 treatments, yeah. both medicines and procedures and things that, that I had uh, tried. I desperately want to get back to my work. I love my work. That's one of the difficulties um, that there is about the situation uh, that we have here. Uh, whereby um, from from other places we keep hearing um, we want to help strivers, not skivers. Um, and the system is supposedly set up to, to deal with the, the so-called skivers. It's language that I don't particularly like and I think it's extremely unhelpful. And I think the point that I'm trying to, to, to find out from, from you guys is that even though um, you've, you've had... Uh, some troubles in terms of yourselves, Miss Hepburn and Mr. McGahey, and, and, and in terms of your husband, uh, Mrs. McMurchie, there has always been that uh, willingness, that desire to actually carry on and work if that's at all possible. Yes, it, it isn't, you know, and that's what makes it so particularly offensive, mm -hmm. you know, which, which makes it so sore, uh, so, so demoralising uh, with it. And because, you know, we all are trying, you know, our very, very best. But the trouble is, is that with the DWP and with ATOS, is it, it penalises the very people that do try, you know, like we, we turned up smartly dressed. You know, we make an effort. You know, none of us are, are you know, we, we don't sit about complaining about our situation. Coming here is difficult for us. You know, I, I tried to allude it, you know, I, I tried to make my report factual. It wasn't in about, you know, the day-to-day -day emotions of the, the thing with it. Because we try to be positive and we try to get on as best we can. And that is held against you. One of the, the things in, um, with incapacity benefit, which um, I don't think is actually available with um, employment support allowances, um, once my husband was on incapacity benefit, there, is, there was a... a part of the programme um, called uh, Supported Permitted Work. I don't know if you've heard yeah. of that. Yeah. Support. And my husband um, was very, very keen to try and get some work. And um, we invested um, some of our savings in a mobile disco because he loves music. And we um, were, he was supported by Fife Employability Team to, um, to gear him up and how to organise himself for that. And I became his roadie and <laughs> learned how to wire up a disco <laughs> at 58 years old and travelled with him 
all the time, and my daughter helped out as well, setting up this mobile disco. Um, and he was allowed to do that under the benefit of yeah. incapacity benefit. He was allowed to do that as long as he didn't work a certain amount of hours a week. He only worked maybe once a month or something if he was lucky. But he got a lot of satisfaction and self-worth out of that. Um, and he only worked for, through word of mouth, he never advertised. It was people who he knew asked him to come along and do that. Um, but of course, that's all gone because he's now not in receipt of any kind of benefits whatsoever. Um, and Fife Employability are not supporting him any longer as well because, you know, they're you know, their role with him. So he's basically on the scrap heap now. Um, but he still has another five years to go to get his pension. Um. Can I ask Mr McGahey just one final question, um, convener, and it's round about um, fibromyalgia, because I think it's something that a, a lot of people don't really understand. Um, I, I wonder if you could maybe describe the chronic pain that sometimes you feel um, with with the illness, um, I think uh, you know from my perspective, uh, knowing a little bit about um, about it, uh, you get an insight. But uh, if you could give a description, I think that would be useful for for us. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's if if I was going in mastermind, my specialist subject would be this because you know I can read any medical journal. You know, the, the medical stuff's easy for me, so I'm jammed up to the ceiling in it. It's a, it's a neurological condition. It, you know, people say you're looking grand. I said, well, you should see my neurotransmitters. You know, they, <laughs> they're all over the place. Um, but I wake up in the morning in pain and I go to sleep at night in pain. Um, and if I do anything, you know, I call them stressors, um, but anything aggravates it. You know, sitting, going, sitting with a meal, sitting, speaking with my friends, concentrating a conversation with my friends for an hour aggravates the symptoms with it. As well as, you know, the pain, which is generalised, you can get localised headaches, um, the other things, you get nausea um, that builds up. And, you know, when, if you've got a sore head and you're feeling sick, you know, concentrating is very, very difficult. Um, and, you know, on tasks, as I said, you know, as a vet, I, I wrote reports. You know, obviously, you know, it was one of the hardest degrees to get through. Um, you know, seven hundred and fifty words. I think it took me four hours. You know, to 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 do that, sitting, looking at the the thing with it. And as I say, anything I do exacerbates the symptoms. So I have to make. And as I say, I, I keep trying to get as much as I can out of life. But for everything I do, I class that as a benefit, but there's a cost for it. So again, with the, with the ATOS assessment, you can walk, you know, 100 yards. I, I do, I, once a week, I go out with a friend with a similar illness, and we go out and we get the fresh air and stuff, and then I come home and I go to my bed, and I don't schedule anything for the next day. I mean, it, it, it's normally Monday. I, I, if I was coming here, then I would cancel the walk on the Monday, and I wouldn't shed. I have nothing scheduled at all for tomorrow. Thank you very much. I, I think you're very brave, and we're very grateful for, for your evidence today. Thank you, Convener. Annabelle, you wanted to ask a small supplementary before I come to Ian? Uh, yeah. Thank you, Convener, and uh, thank you as well uh, for coming in, and it really has been very useful for the committee, and I hope anybody watching the proceedings this morning or at some later stage to see exactly what this all means for, for individual human beings, uh, because that's what it's all about at the end of the day. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, it wasn't entirely supplementary to Kevin's, but it was rather, you may be aware that we have uh, sought to have the UK Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, Mr Ian Duncan Smith, come before this committee form in a formal session to have a similar exchange uh, and to ask him questions and hopefully obtain answers. But sadly, he has thus far refused to do so. So I would like to ask each of you in turn, what would you like to ask Mr Ian Duncan Smith? I, I would just ask him, where is your heart? 
and where's your sense? You know, you put me back to work, okay, I'll be there on Monday, I'll be there on Tuesday, I might be there on Wednesday, don't know if I'll be there on Thursday, definitely won't be there on Friday. And who's going to employ a woman who can fall over nothing and have to go home and get showered? Just, I, I feel that they have no idea of reality, of real life living with a disability at all. Leslie? Probably for me it would be um, my husband paid in many, many years in to, um, to with the view that when, if he was old um, or older, he's 60, so he's not old, keeps telling me, um, that he would be looked after. And we are now in the position where he is not looked after. Um, in fact, the, the state, if you like, has contributed to making him in a worse position than he was June last year. Um, and I thought when, um, I'm a history graduate, when we set up the welfare state, it was to be there for people like my husband who worked really hard, who did his best, and so that in times of need, there would be something there, and it's not there. So that's my question for him. There should be something there for these hard-working men and women who have worked and contributed to um, society, and they are left then with nothing. Is it Ian? Yeah, would your I'd, question be? I'd, I'd thought about this before. And, um, my, my question to him would be, and, I, and I'm certain, I know that the you know, the UK government ministers didn't phone triage up and say to them, you know, you refer to your clients as uh, LTBs. I don't think they told them specifically to do that, but I'd, I'd ask them, you know, why he felt that it was right that he could create the atmosphere where this didn't seem to be such a bad thing. And I would ask him if he had any, it's a stupid question, ask him if he had any, guilt or any compassion or any regret about having created the conditions that people that are supposed to be helping them, you know, generate, you know, that kind of disgraceful offensive. Well, thank you very much, all three of you, and I sincerely hope that Mr Ian Duncan Smith has been listening to you. Thank you, Convener. Okay. Uh, one day is a small supplementary. Okay. Annabelle was similar. Uh, but at the end. All right, Ian. <coughs> Thanks, Convener. Um, I, I, I just wanted to um, try and tease out a couple of themes uh, from uh, the evidence that we've heard, which relate to uh, ongoing concerns, I think, that the committee have got about the way the, the, the process is, is working. And um, the first is one which seemed to me to be, um, to a degree, common to Mrs McMurtry's evidence and also Mr McGahey's, which was the capacity of the system to make a fair assessment of mental health problems. Um, you uh, said, Mrs McMurtry, in your evidence that you felt the assessment was almost entirely about your husband's physical health. And I think you said only five minutes out of the 60 was devoted to, um, to his mental health. And, and Mr McGahey slightly differently, but you're, it's not, I know it's not a resolution, but progress was made when your, your consultant psychiatrist was listened to by DWP. And I know there was then further mess ups about calling you back in but but at least it did seem that at, at, there was a point there where actually your psychiatrist's evidence was was listened to and so I, I really wanted to ask both of you a, a little more about that whether you feel that the process uh, the questions the, the structure of the assessment doesn't allow a proper assessment to be made of uh, mental health problems or if you feel that those who are carrying out the assessments at ATOS don't have the expertise or the experience to recognise or understand those problems, and I just wonder which, which you felt it was. Or maybe I'm missing the mark altogether. I don't think so. Um, 
for me as an onlooker, I would have said that um, the, the structure of the actual um, assessment, because he was very slow and took a long time to do the physical part, because he had to do bending and stretching and things like that, and that took quite a bit of time. The amount of time that was left was very short, so therefore it had to be very rushed. But I think the, my personal view on it was that the nurse herself was had a, certain questions that she needed to get answered. And with someone with mental health problems, it's very, uh, my view is it's very difficult for them to actually have insight into the difficulties they have. And they take quite a bit of teasing out of what they're saying and clarifying what that is. And there wasn't enough time, but I don't think she would have been skilled enough from what I, I, I observed and things like some of the comments that she made and her manner. Um, when I compare that to one of the doctors who he ha had, who, you know, made my husband very comfortable. You made That's quite an interesting contrast yes. that Previously, you I think previously you felt that the DWP process uh -huh. pre atos yes. actually did make a fair assessment. It did of, make of a fair, assessment. and we were very happy with how it went. Um, the doctor was um, extremely skilled. I don't know who he was, but he was extremely skilled, and within minutes made my husband that, feel. That wasn't, that wasn't a doctor that knew your husband. That no, was a DWP. No, was, was I think they were called BAMs or something they, that DWP appointed. Yeah, you. They, he made him feel relaxed. He, um, you know, he he could talk and clarify, and um, there was none of that at this. It was just so it's not impossible to make a fair assessment. It's just not. It certainly now, was much fairer. Think. Um, in my opinion, yeah. the previous um, way, um, but this experience was not. Sure. Give us an idea. When, what, how long ago, in this, the the process, did, did uh, you, uh, your husband, go through these uh, DWP assessments? Right. Uh, he he went through um, two. Over the past five years, he had two. Um, face-to-face -face medicals with a DWP doctor and one written one. And they were all... Oh, this within was the last five years? Within the last five years. Okay, so we're not going back a long time no, into the past? No, we're not. Now, so. um, and the, the, certainly the, um, the two with the doctor, I was present, and they were excellent. Okay. Yep, the, it's paradoxical, but actually... <coughs> I don't actually have many psychological problems or psychiatric ones. Um, it's historical. The, um, when I first had chronic fatigue, the only person in my area that was dealing with it happened to be a consultant psychiatrist. Um, and I've, it's been hereditary. I see his occupational therapist is the best person that helped me for it. Um, what they do is um, they you know, are very useful in giving me coping strategies. They, they give me ways of dealing with it, with the, the, the physical signs. But I would say with Atos, you know, they, they, they have, my impression is, is that um, although they say it's nurses that are doing the assessments and doctors, you could have a secretary doing it because they're ticking boxes on a preset form. It doesn't take medical skills for them to do it. They ask, you know, can you walk? And people say yes, and they tick a box, yes. They're not making detailed psychological assessments with them. They're saying, you know, can you get up in the morning? You know, um, do, do you like yourself? And again, your experience of DWP was rather better than your experience of Atos. Is that fair? I mean, in well, the end, DWP did... They, they, um, they, they eventually they, came, yeah. put you on the support group, didn't you? And Which is all you, I was asking you, for. You also yeah. had much higher scores when they assessed your evidence than when Atos assessed it and assigned you a score of zero, your evidence. Yeah. Is, yeah. But again, they did it once. I had reports from occupational therapists, GPs. But one of the big problems is is that um, you know, they didn't when it first went in. It was only when there was... You know, again, it was another occupational therapist report. 
but it was only at the you know at the very last junction you know when you know week before I was due uh, and, and, I, and I don't know what my the consultant psychiatrist said that changed their mind and the, the thing is is that as I said in that first time when they phoned me up to say I had a zero score um, you know, it, it was only well into the conversation. I said, well, what am I going to do? And he said, well, you know, and I said, but my occupational therapist, I'll say that, and he said, oh, well, you can maybe get reports from them. I said, I didn't know that. They, they, they'd never said anywhere. Right. So then I had to start that process. So it wasn't made clear to you how you could no, appeal the no, decision? No, That's right. As I said, I'm a, you know, a robust, strong character. You know, there's not many people say... You know, <laughs> would say I was easier, you know, a walk over. Um, but this process, you know, has pushed me to, to the very edge. And that's the main reason I'm here. You know, if it's, if it's doing that to somebody, you know, I've got superb family support, I've got great friends, you know, because, of, you know, the medics are very good with me, um, I know who to access, you know, I'm the, I'm the person that should have it the easiest. And it was an utter nightmare. Thank you. The, the, the other uh, different theme which the committee's been exploring is um, the role of GPs, uh, yes. particularly in uh, initial evidence, but then also in providing appeal support. Now, I wanted to ask Mrs McMurtry then a, a, a little more about what seems to be a pretty poor experience that, that, that you had with, with your husband's GP. and. Why? Uh, you, you, what we've been told is that um, if GPs are asked for evidence by DWP or Atos as their agent, that they're contractually required to provide that. But if they're asked by um, the the person, their patient, um, for an appeal, they can simply refuse, or they can charge, uh, because it's outside the contract. So I just I just wondered if you could expand a little bit about. This, this encounter with your husband's GP? Well, I, I went with him, obviously. Um, and we explained um, that he had had the assessment and that um, he was fit for work. We went over um, how he was um, before the assessment and then subsequent to the assessment. And um, we said that um, we needed his support for this and uh, he was very, very clear that um, he was of the opinion that my husband had had a medical assessment by a health professional who had submitted evidence that had proven he was fit for work and that that was fact. So I don't understand this. Surely your GP is supposed to pro provide evidence to inform ATOS, not ATOS provide evidence to inform your yeah. GP. Well, yes, huh? that's, I, that's, and my, I had, um, my husband spoke very little, and I had a good, long, hearty conversation with him about um, whether tomorrow my husband would be able to go out and work a 40-hour week. Was that his medical opinion? And he eventually came round and said, well, I think, you know, we could maybe manage part-time work. And I said, "My part-time work? OK, let's see um, if we get anywhere with that. And unfortunately, that was the wrong thing to do. I then went to see my own GP because I was feeling the stress of all of this and spoke to her at great length. And her view was that very understanding of, you know, how I was feeling, but was um, very careful to say um, the benefits system, they can't afford the benefits system, the, you know, the government. And, you know, it's, you know, people have to be assessed and, um, you know, if you're assessed as fit, you're fit. And that was my, the two people in my practice. Um, and that was where we ended up. 
Of that's part of the problem we have here. It's not for the GPs to decide whether we can afford the benefit system or not. It's for I them to provide absolutely. Uh, the evidence about their patients. Okay, thanks very much. Could, could I just add one thing about the, sorry, you know, the exact thing with the GPs is that um, their evidence is still assessed within this very, very rigid framework, which is the, these criteria that ATOS tick which the assessors at the DWP go down. And if your GP's written report doesn't fit into that, then they can say you're not fit to My GP says he's not fit to work, um, but he goes a walk. You know, as in this was a positive, I make an effort to go out. So now, you know, because I can walk, I can get uh, employment support. So the GPs don't know. I, I think that's a really important point because I think when you speak to people who have experience representing claimants in the system, they, they will say sometimes that, yes, even where GPs do provide evidence, the evidence they provide doesn't answer the questions that actually have to be answered. But I think what the committee have identified is a, a more fundamental problem where some GPs at least simply refuse to provide the evidence altogether, which, you know, is one stage worse. Anna. Yeah, no, just um, can I give my apologies for being a wee bit late this morning. I'm sorry, particularly to you, Marnie. Um, it's just like everything we hear, it's chaos. You know, before somebody even gets to, to their assessment, there's the uncertainty as to whether the doctor first supplies something um, or indeed will. And we keep hearing conflicting evidence from all parties. But I think that I, I would like that really well tracked, if, if I can say that, convener, and, and to the clerks, just this total inconsistency we get from all, all the different players involved. But what strikes me as really awful is that once you actually get there, and I think, Ian, you refer to it as the tick box, and I, I just can't begin to imagine the frustration you must feel when <coughs> the boxes are getting ticked and you're not able to qualify that in any way at all, and then you get a 70-page report that bears no relation uh, to, to your own situation. The worrying thing is that the way PIP's going, it's exactly the same because I have got a copy of the descriptors. Uh, and I think it was early on, uh, and I think you all referred to it, was the added stress that causes. So here we are, if we could let Mr Ian Duncan Smith know that he's actually making people more ill mm -hmm. yeah. uh, by, by the actions that are going on. And uh, again, I think when you said, Ian, that um, you all have a level of support, be it family, friends, whatever, um, and professional backgrounds and ability to cope, and terrible things have happened to you. Um, but, you know, for someone on their own who has perhaps always suffered uh, in some way and has never been able to, you know, to hold down a, a long-term job, the stress of that is absolutely horrendous. And again, um, I, I would like you, convener, to, to put in on record, and perhaps Mr. Ian Duncan Smith, I received an email yesterday from someone contemplating suicide because of welfare reform. So the situation is absolutely horrendous. But back to this, um, you know, issue of no discretion. I think Leslie, it was yourself. It was, in fact, um, you know, you talked about your husband having done voluntary. Uh, work in the past. No, sorry, Marlene, that was yourself. You, you're secretary to the MS Society. So there's voluntary work being done here. There's something being given to society um, by <coughs> someone who is not who is unable to work. Um, and, and you were saying, Leslie, that your husband was able before to try a new initiative and something that actually could have affected his well-being and mental health better. But then the, the way you were treated when there was the potential of part-time work that you thought might have been a, a way to open the door. So I'm really interested, convener, in knowing that what the, the situation is in regard to voluntary work, which is a contribution to society, and about part-time work and the ability to ease someone back into work and make the best of the skills they've got. I realise I've just given a bit of a lecture and not really asked you questions, I'm sorry, but you, you, your answers were just so 
powerful um, as to what we're trying to find out here. Was the part-time work just discounted altogether, Leslie? I, I have really no um, clear picture of this, but I do think in, if you go into perhaps one of the support groups, there may be some support there, but I have, you know, that's not open. Um, I've, I've not experienced that. All I know is my husband now is not having um, these, he's, he's not getting any benefit. He's not part of Fife employability anymore. Um, but yeah, it is a cost now to mm. society because he's uh -huh. seen a psychiatrist. He has his two afternoons. And I asked him, um, how long is this to go on? And he said, well, one of them, um, he really, he's, he's finding them very beneficial. He said, one I can continue with ad infinitum. The other one I'll go for eight weeks and then they'll review it and see how I am. I may have to continue with it. Um, and I do f find that that's been quite beneficial, but it's also a cost. Um, and I, I would think that weighing up the cost of, um, you know, him going to um, hospital two afternoons a week compared to what he was getting, where he was coping quite well, doing his wee disco and getting his um, benefit. I think if you weigh it up, I don't know which one would cost most, but I would rather think that the the, the two inpatient days will be. Um, the other thing, um, convener, that's horrified me is the the, the way that uh, the medical input that seems to be there. You know, when you turn up, but it's, it's, it seems to be very dismissive. And and again, we took evidence from Lanarkshire Health Board. I can't remember the name of the organisation. Salas, who are going to be taking over um, in a slightly different context, but some of that role. And uh, they they were very. Um, firm in saying that because of their rigorous um, medical background um, that they would be able to be very efficient. Um, I can't remember the words they used in caring in the way that they did assessments. Uh, I wouldn't mind some supplementary stuff from them as a result of some of what we've heard today. Yeah, I think we've, we've made it. Well, Salas are not mm -hmm. yet uh, operating the, the PIP system. They're gearing up for it. I think it's June that they start to yeah. take that forward. So obviously that's something we'll need to keep an eye on and have them in once they're um, have actually started to implement the system, but yeah, it's something we'll need to be very, because, very careful. Absolutely, because while, whilst you know, there's this great feeling of helplessness. If there's anything at all that can be done to make things a, a wee bit better anywhere, I think we should be pushing for that. Alex, so, thank, thank you. you. Uh, I wondered if I could ask each of you uh, if you have gone through a formal appeal process in relation to a decision that was made after an ATOS assessment? I'm going through one on Thursday. And you haven't been through one haven't yet? Been through well, one. Well, but you may be close enough to, to be able to help. Have either the other uh, uh, been through a formal process? We can't appeal because we don't have the back of our GP. Mm -hmm. That was the, the advice we were given it, by the citizens. It's particularly the, the connection with GPs and medical yeah. professionals that, that I'm concerned we about. We can't appeal Can, the decision. Can I ask uh, Marlene Hepburn particularly at this moment then, uh, what level or, or who is assisting you to go through that appeal process? I have a representative from Macmillan in long term conditions. He's a benefits advisor. He has been really, really good. I mean, any time I've had to contact him, see if Ron comes on the phone, my stress level just drops. He will come with me to the assessment. Um, he's my representative. He's appointed. But I got the notification of the appeal before he did because I phoned him up and said, oh, Ron, I've got a date for my appeal. Well, have you? Oh, I haven't heard. So I had my date, so I phoned him. He penciled it in. He will be there. But he said, he explained, he has explained the process that, that I will go through, and he's been really, really good. And he says, just explain the situation, Marlene. And then he says, I will come in if there's something that I don't think you've explained or understood fully, maybe a question they've given you. But I think it's the fact that it's a lawyer, an employment lawyer, and a doctor will be the two there, and me and Ron. I wonder if we could make a note of the advisor who's assisted and just make sure that they are uh, included in the process to ensure that there's financial support being directed in their direction. I'm sure there is, but it would be, be something we should check. You said that there was a, a, a doctor and a lawyer uh, involved in the process. Uh, now, the the doctor and, uh, and the lawyer, uh, 
who is uh, funding them? I have no idea. Ah. It's a, he, Ron has assured me they are totally independent. Totally. Yeah. The, the doctor in particular, uh, I, I take it this is not your GP? No, it will not be my GP. It will be a doctor. Yes. I don't know who. Are you aware of the, the how the system has worked and how uh, your own GP or other health professionals, I noticed you mentioned two or three uh, health professionals who work, you work with, have they been, uh, to your knowledge, asked to supply evidence for this appeal? To go for an appeal, I had to submit two supporting pieces of evidence. So I contacted my MS nurse and she has written a report, which they have a copy of, and my continence nurse has written a report, again they have a copy. Yes, um, but your GP wasn't involved. GP's not involved. Uh -huh. the, and, um, I wish you the best of luck with that. Uh, I think that's very useful to hear your experience. Perhaps it might have been more beneficial if we'd, we'd known how it turned out, but it's still very useful to be able to talk to someone who is in the process. Uh, moving on to Mrs McMurchy, you say that you, we've heard from a number of uh, the comments you've made that you have not had the feedback you might have wanted from your GP. Right. Do you therefore consider that the, the appeals process uh, is likely to be less useful to you? The advice that we were given um, by Citizens Advice up until we had been um, with them advising us right through um, filling in the forms and everything was that without um, our GP um, providing a detailed report, there was no point in going to appeal because we would <coughs> still have the evidence of the ATOS assessment and the forum that he had filled in. And I'm surprised that, at what you've told us today, mm -hmm. uh, given that, of course, the role of a GP should be to provide their opinion of your husband's case uh, and not to pri provide their opinion of somebody else's assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible that it uh, may be possible to explore that further or do you feel that that I avenue think, is completely I cut think off? now the advice that um, we've been given is that it's now over six months since he, um, he claimed, uh, you know, that since uh, he went through the assessment and we can put in a completely new claim but I still would have to have my GP. And I think there's some advice to GPs here about what their role is um, and in um, you know, these appeals and also in providing evidence. A, a, a lack of understanding well, among Well, both GPs, GPs in the same practice. One is saying um, that you, they can't, um, we can't afford all this, or no, he, mm -hmm. she can't afford it. But the, you know, the government can't afford um, the cost of benefits. And the other one is saying, well, you've been assessed by medical professionals who've said that, so therefore, um, you know. So there certainly looks as though there is some training that's required by GPs. Um, uh, moving on to Mr McGarkey, the you uh, said in your uh, opening remarks that you have had some success uh, in changing uh, your course through the process, uh, but you haven't been through a formal appeal uh, process. Uh, can I ask uh, where the what your uh, level of satisfaction with the involvement of health professionals who are responsible for your care was uh, in the process that you've gone through? I went through an appeals process. I just didn't get to the tribunal. Um, they changed their mind, you know, at the last minute, just before the tribunal was called. Again, I said, you know, I'm a strong character, and and when the, with the prospect of you know dealing with an appeal, you know, I couldn't cope with it in my own, um, even with the you know the support of you know very capable wife. Specifically on the, the input from health, health professionals who've been working with your case, do you feel that their input may have had an influence in changing the decisions uh, that were made before you got to the tribunal? Well, it was amazing. The, the, the first three inputs, consultant, physician, uh, occupational therapist and GP, didn't. They told me, and as I said, you know, that call I got was that, uh, you know, what somebody from the DWP said that, you know, he wouldn't have even put me in the work-related scheme with, with the, the input from those three. And then two weeks later, he gets the input from the clinic, uh, from the 
psychiatrist and he said he spoke to her completely and they, they completely flipped. But I mean, I was going to the tribunal with um, somebody from Money Matters, South Lanarkshire Money Matters. That's I think that's the social work department. Um, they were very helpful. Um, my occupational therapist was, you know, she was saying, "You know, try and stop me coming to it." And I think there were, you know, there was uh, some other of the medical profession were going to go. I was running a bus trip to my tribunal with the people that were going to be there to to support me. The, it's come up in evidence before that the, the importance of having health professionals uh, have an input to this. Uh, do I get the impression that, or would it be fair for me that, to uh, summarise the impression that we're getting here is that the, some are good, some are bad, and it can be a bit hit or miss? The one thing is, is that, you know, I said the first three were, they were very, very good, but the reports didn't include or weren't based on what the DWP wanted to hear. They were given their informed medical opinion, but it didn't fit into the, the, the format that the DWP had established. And that's why it didn't go through. And whatever you know, my psychiatrist said, you know, obviously did fit into their box. So what we could be looking at here is a large number of very clever people who don't communicate very effectively. <laughs> It's, it's, well, I, I don't think they've been given, you know, the criteria on which they've to base it. You know, they've been not been told uh, what information that they're wanted from. They don't know. They submitted what they thought were very comprehensive, very honest reports on my ability, and they were dismissed. They were classed as not relevant by the assessor at the DWP, the decision maker. Thank you. Had a go. I'm going to give you one very small point, Kevin. No very, speech is just a very short. No, I, I'm, I'm going to be very brief, this convener. Has been arduous for the witnesses. So I'm, going I'm going to be very brief because I think it's information that we actually require and may be helpful to others as well. And that's round about some of the points that Mrs. McMurtry made about non-supportive doctor. But her, her husband is accessing other services where there are other people involved. And I think we need to find out whether a, a, a further appeal needs the support of a GP or if other folks involved um, are, 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 are uh, relevant to this. Beyond that, convener, I think one of the, the things which we need to find out <coughs> is the actual cost of the appeals process, because that's coming to, 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 to light much more and more. Because you have a doctor, you have a lawyer, you have a clerk and team, and all of the rest of it. How much is that actually costing as well? And beyond that, the supporting witnesses that folk uh, require. And I think that that is something that we need to dig deeper on as well. But I think the key thing is in terms of helping Mrs. McMurchy and others in the same position whose GPs are not supportive, yeah. can they get other medical professionals to back them for an appeal? That was a useful contribution. I have, do realise that we've been putting you through quite a, a lengthy uh, grilling here, and I hope that you didn't find it too stressful. Um, before we close this part of the, the meeting, do you want to draw your own conclusions, say something just in, in finishing? That you Can I just say that yeah. it's had a huge impact on my mental health. I now view my disease in a completely different way. Um, as I say, I worked as a teacher. I got out of teaching because of my MS. I try to keep myself out of the benefit system. I'm keeping myself active. I've just picked up my new car through DLA. <laughs> I thought, just got in there. But I've just picked that up, and then they're telling me, oh, no, you're fit to work. Um, I just, as, as I, I don't know what the cost, the cost of me coming here the cost of the appeal, which is apparently £3,000 each time. And if I didn't have people to support me, like Ron McIntosh, he's Money Matters, Sterling, and honestly, these people are worth their weight in gold, but they are so overwhelmed by this that I worry for people coming behind me. I'm lucky. I've got him. I've seen people in my own local branch that I think, you go through this, you're not going to survive. I'm quite a strong person. But that comes across against me. I'm too independent. I'm too self-sufficient. I live on my own. I look after myself. That was one thing I'm in my, my comments in my report. She's, I said, I do housework. 
My sister just a bit fell off the seat at that point because I only do it when she's coming to visit me. <laughs> and she went, it's not a big house. And in the report from Atos, Miss Hepburn does housework. Not a big house is in brackets. And I thought, how petty can you be? And that just sums up the whole thing. It's too bureaucratic. It's completely heartless. And as the guy who devised the system said, it's not fit for purpose and people will suffer. I'm suffering. I, you know, I'd, I'd looked up a quotation about, you know, the, you know, government and, and civilization, and they say, you know, the moral test of it is how they look after their old and their sick and their young. Um, I'd like to thank everybody here, you know, for, you know, my government here caring, you know, about these matters. I think it's come up in other ones that, you know, we certainly do not get that impression from Westminster. So I'm extremely grateful to each and every one of you, you know, our re representatives for caring, you know, about the people that can look after themselves. I think it's a very sick system that has been um, put in place, and it certainly doesn't have um, the people at its heart, um, and it certainly um, needs to be totally overhauled, um, reflecting the previous system for us was a much more hearty system um, which had patience or, or claimants at its heart. Um, and I think they maybe have to look back on what, what they did and what they've put in its place and what the differences are um, there. Thanks so much to each and every one of you for taking the time to come in and inform us and advise us uh, about your experiences of this system. I mean, what we heard this morning from my perspective was three very reasonable people who understood that the system had to exist um, and that there may have been flaws and cracks in that system. But what you've exposed to us is that the system has now been smashed. Uh, and it's not just about the system. And, and I think what we need to get uh, questions and we'll review the evidence and we'll discuss what we do in terms of what we heard this morning. But what we have to do is ask questions about what this is doing to individuals, because this is about individuals and not numbers. Um, and what we've heard this morning is three people who have made their own effort, they've tried their best to, to uh, recover from their own uh, circumstances, and it's, it's the system that's put them down. Um, and that should not be the way that the welfare system operates. And I just think, you know, the more we hear from people, the more uh, angry, certainly, I, I'm getting about this. Um, but I also uh, have a great deal of sympathy for those who are having to endure. Uh, what has been put in place. And uh, as I said, we'll look at the evidence we heard this morning. We'll work on what we have to do to, um, to get more information and, and test exactly what's going on here. But we couldn't have done that without you this morning. So thanks very much to each and every one of you. And at that, I'll, I'll close the meeting for, or uh, suspend for 10 minutes until we uh, come back and finish the meeting.